Hello, uh, doctor, can you tell me your name, where and when was you born? Uh, boy, my name is uh, Zhao Ngoc Wang, it's an American way, you know, in Vietnamese I would say Dr. Wang Ngoc Yao, okay. Yes. I was born in Mito, uh, which is a small town in the southern part of Vietnam, about 70 kilometers south of Saigon. I see. Um, do you remember any about uh, your hometown, where was you born and uh, you grown up? Yes, uh, Vietnam, I mean, Mito is a very small provincial town in the south of uh, Saigon, about 70 kilometers uh, south of Saigon. It is part of the southern province of uh, Vietnam. It is an administrative town. Uh, uh, I think it's very, you know, low key. I remember it's very calm and peaceful. Uh, I was growing up there until I was eight. And uh, when I reached eight of uh, eight years old, I decided, you know, with my mom, that I would like to go to Saigon to attend a better education. So I went to Saigon to go to a Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic French school run by the La Salle brother. Oh, La Salle brother. Yeah. yeah. You remember about anything about uh, La Salle school and uh, you know. Uh, Anything interesting, sad, happy in last time school in, in your life? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I may, be, I may be an oddity because uh, I have a lot of French influence uh, growing up. As I say, I attended you know, French uh, second, you know, primary as well as secondary school. So I always grew up with all the French textbooks. In fact, you know, when I was 18, I spoke French more fluently than I would speak Vietnamese. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, but at that uh, time, uh, how you do for hobby, sport, or anything that you involve in when you? Well, I like like any you know schoolboy. We were playing in sports. Uh, I was playing soccer. Oh. You know, we love soccer, and I was playing uh, volleyball. Oh. Volleyball, yeah. Do any? I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, can yeah. yeah, no contact sport. No, no, no. no. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I heard that the last time. Um, if it was very good school during that time, and uh, the education quality was excellent. And um, uh, do you feel that way too? And uh, do you have any memory with those uh, teachers over there, how they were teaching you and how they treat you? Uh, yeah, I think the La Salle Brothers, which is a, you know, a Catholic institution, is very well because uh, all those, uh, even though they are not priests, but they have to have a vow of celibacy so they cannot get married. So they will. Uh, really, they put all their life to teaching you know, kids around the world. And the La Salle, you know, order is a uh, worldwide kind of uh, organization. They would have school all over the world. Wherever there was French influence, they would build the school to educate the uh, kids. You know, you have you know, La Salle Brothers School even here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you have also you know, around the globe, you know, wherever you have a French a French former colony, they would have a La Salle Brothers School. And uh, I think the kind of education they gave is pretty good, and uh, one of the products of uh, uh, their education. And uh, lately, we still have uh, organizations called uh, Friendship of the La Salle Brothers. So we still have keep them. Keep in touch. Yeah, we, should, we still keep in touch. In fact, there's a website, uh, La Salle, you know. I see. Yeah, I think. Uh, tabelasha.com on the website, yeah. Yes. So they will still keep in touch. And I still have some friends of mine who are still in Vietnam, and one of my classmates, Dr. Nguyen Jung Chi, mm. is still one of their, I think, uh, director, you know, of the branch in Saigon, yeah. Mm. I heard most of the, uh, I mean, former Lhasa students were very successful. Like you just mentioned by your name, another doctor. Can you tell me about that? Yes, the reason I, 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 I went to the Catholic school instead of going to the usual, you know, uh, school in Saigon was because my father he was a he was a teacher. He taught oh. uh, French, uh, you know, in in Vietnam, but he also was very well aware that 
the, he didn't want me to attend the public school because at that time he thought the public school are too liberal. Okay. So he wanted me to have a good Catholic foundation and a good moral. So that's why he refused to let me go to Shaslu Loba, which is a you know public school. I In fact, I <coughs> I was accepted to go to Shaslu Loba, and I begged him to let me go to that school, but he re absolutely refused. I see. He forbid me to go to a public school because he wants me to have a good morals. I see. Yeah. And the public school, you don't have to pay, and last time you have to pay, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, he said that he can afford to pay for my, you know, education, and but he wants to make sure that I will become, when I grow up, I will be a good citizen, and I have a good moral character because he didn't trust the public school because they are too liberal. Yeah. It seems like your father really willing to invest in education for you, and uh, can you tell um, us about your father? Uh, what you can think, remember of him? And Oh, uh, he's always uh, kind. Uh, he's a very kind person. He's, uh, as I say, he was a teacher, and uh, he for him education is very important. He keep telling me that uh, men without education uh, would not, you know, come to anything. So for him education is very very important. He stressed that in, to me. So that's why when I was uh, eight, I remember my mother always asking me what I would like to do, say I want to go to Saigon, I want to go to the best school there is. <laughs> <laughs> she was trying to, you know, sway me and, and, and give me a lot of new toys or new bike and to convince me to stay in Mito because she didn't want to let me go to uh, far away from home because she already sent my older brother, Philip, in, 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 in France I to see. study. And she would refuse to let me go to France because she would say, no, what is enough, I, she wants to keep me at home. I see. So you were a baby in the house. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Well, <coughs> we were four, you know, in the family. I have my older brother, Philip, uh -huh. uh, my sister, Lily, myself, and I have a younger brother, Roger, yeah. I see. So all my two brothers went to France to study. I was <laughs> the only one who was not allowed to go to France. <laughs> Your baby, you need to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yes. Um, your name is Huang Ngoc Zhao. Uh, is it any traditional about the name of your family? Like uh, Huang Ngoc is for boy and Huang whatever for yep. girl. Uh, can you tell me? Yeah. All well, three of us are Huang Ngoc, okay? My f oldest brother is Huang Ngoc Lung. Okay? My sister is also Huang Ngoc, but oh. then Huang Thay uh -huh. Ngoc Jung. Uh -huh. I, I will be Wang of Yao, and my youngest brother would be Wang of Shen. Oh, Shen. Yeah. I see. Um, and your dad, her name is Wang of. No, no. Oh. My dad's name is Wang Sung Mao. Oh, Sung Mao. I see. The reason we have the in middle name Ngoc because he took after my mother. My mother oh. is Nguyen Gat Thi Ngoc Hoa. Oh. Okay. She, she, he wants to incorporate both. Uh, I see. Okay. His name and my mother's name. So that's why we end up having Wang Ngoc uh, as yeah. our name. Yeah. Yeah. You're very kind and yeah. fair, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Um, is it in your family when you were young any particular, I mean, uh, food or tradition or, or celebrating, um, you know, uh, um, anything that you think that uh, ha happening to your family or <coughs> tradition, uh, traditional thing? Yes. As I say, we have, uh, you know, even though we were Vietnamese, but I think we had a very Good French influence in our family life. I was growing up. I always remember uh, celebrating Christmas and New Year. Mm -hmm. But we also have Vietnamese uh, also celebrations inside in, in our family. We would celebrate uh, the Vietnamese New Year. Mm -hmm. So I remember for the Vietnamese New Year, we always come back to visit my uh, grandparents from my mother's side. So we would spend you know a week with them, and we have a lot of foods to eat and games to play. So I was. As I was growing up, I would say I had a very happy family, even though I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but it's pretty much like that. <laughs> <laughs> happy story. A very happy story, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I, how about your grandparents? Do you have, I mean, opportunity to live with them for a little bit? Or? Yes. <clears throat> you know, when I came here, what I was struck when I came to the U.S. is they have such a nuclear family. When talking family here, we talk about parents and kids, that's all. Mm -hmm. But for Vietnamese, when we talk about family, it's always extended family. The family always include grandparents. Yeah. Or, and happily, you sometimes, you know, certain families would include also grand-grandparents. Yes. And didn't have the 
you know, uh, opportunity to have grand grandparents, but I have both sets of grandparents, both from my father's side and from my mother's side. So I was growing up. I always remember, you know, family events. I have always included very large extended family. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, we back to your family. Uh, immediate family. How influenced you in uh, your life? Uh, why you make this decision to go to uh, medical school? Did your parents encourage you or they force you or why? <laughs> well, that is uh, also quite a long story. Yeah. Uh, as I say, you know, when I was growing up, it was a very you know happy time for for us. And when I finished high school, there was Dante fifty eight. Uh, I didn't choose to go to medical school. My life was already set up the way I thought it would be, because I was uh, quite a good student, I have to admit, and uh, I had got the scholarship to go to Paris mm -hmm. to study political science. And there was be all my education would be paid, paid by the French government. So I was always had the time ready to go to Paris and spend the next uh, few years learning uh, about political science and working for the, you know, foreign ministry of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But as you, I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, in 58, suddenly there was a change mm -hmm. in the foreign policy of the South Vietnamese government. Mm -hmm. President Jim decided at that time that he would sever any relationship with the French government mm -hmm. and turn toward Washington and become, you know, more, of, you know, American-oriented. So therefore, all of the scholarship were cancelled. Mm -hmm. So I had no way to okay, to go to France to study. So I have to stay in Vietnam and finish my uh, higher education in Vietnam. And at the time, Vietnam was a very few schools. They have the School of Medicine, Dentistry, Pharmacy, uh, School of Law, and the School for Administration. So I didn't want to be a lawyer, and I didn't think that I want to be uh, having a you know education in administration in Vietnam, so the only kind of liberal uh, profession that could choose would be you know medicine. So I did enroll both in law and in medicine. Oh, I see. Okay, but I uh, at the end of the year I succeeded in the first year of medical school. At the time there was not a clear school of medicine. They call the pharmacy of science because you have to take the pre-medical uh, examination, so I, I passed. And it was quite uh, a good prize to get, to, to have, to, 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 to be successful, because I remember there was 2,000 students in the first year, and at the end of the year only 100 would succeed to go, you know, to, go to medical school. So because I passed, so I did I decided uh, there's no need for me to, to study law. And at the time, to study law, you had to learn in Vietnamese. That is kind of drag for me at the time, because as I say, I was more fluent in, in French than in Vietnamese at the time. <laughs> so I decided to continue medicine, so. Uh, can you tell us about uh, medicine, medicine school, uh, I mean university at that time? Uh, you know, student, teacher, practice and everything at that time. And how many years you have to spend in uh, medical school in order for you to become a uh, yeah. doctor? Yes. The French medical system is quite different from the American mm -hmm. medical system because uh, in the U.S. you have to have four years of college before you can attend medical school. Mm -hmm. In Vietnam, the minute you finish high school, that you can enroll into the medical school. If you pass it, then you go into medical school. Mm -hmm. And even though we, only have, we, we don't have the college, you have did one degree only to get to medical school, but once you're medical school, you have to study for six years. So therefore, by the time you graduated from a Vietnamese medical school, you have spent seven years of study. Okay, so and then after seven years, it will be equivalent to a medical degree here, because they would have four years of college and three years of medical school. In Vietnam, you have to have straight one year of pre medical school and then six years of medical school. Yeah. Okay, after become a doctor, you practice in, uh, I mean, um, in Saigon, or what happened? Yeah. Well, as you remember, you know, when I started my medical school, that was in 58, 
and uh, I didn't graduate from medical school until 1966. And before 1966, by I think 1962, there was a, uh, I think there was a general mobilization. So everybody has, you know, any male citizen of uh, about the age of 18 have to join the army mm -hmm. unless they were in, uh, in higher education. Then they can finish their higher education and then join the army. See. So I, I was able to stay in medical school until I finished and I graduated in 1966. When I graduated from 1966, I, I did join the army and I uh, became a medical officer in the South Vietnamese army. I see. Um, during the time you were in school, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of things happening in, in the society. Especially young student, uh, university student, uh, protest here and there, and uh, the coup d'état, the museum, and all that. Do you remember all about that time? What can you share here? Yes, uh, yeah, I remember when I think in '63s, and uh, there was a uh, revolution. So they, you know, uh, topple President Diem, and he ended up getting assassinated. He was killed with his brother. I still remember those. And uh, yeah, there was quite some tibus, tibus time, you know, uh, at the time. I still remember. Yeah. How you feel about 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 that? A lot of people said that they uh, were very sad when I, they heard that the president got killed and things like that. Did you share the same feeling, or you think that uh, you need to? Be, be <coughs> yes, I, 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 at the time, I was very against him too because I didn't think that. Uh, because he was a Catholic, and even though I'm a Catholic myself, I didn't think that he should have uh, uh, let the Catholic influence go so strong that they would be oppressing or giving the feelings that he was oppressing the Buddhism. And I think uh, I put a lot of blame on him for what happened to South Vietnam later on, because he was, you know, the president, he was the commander in chief. And I always feel that if you want to be a leader of a nation, you have to have the skill, you have to have the intelligence, but you will have to have the responsibility to carry out your ultimate responsibility, which is to, to preserve and safeguard the country that you're supposed to be leading. And he failed in that regard. Yeah. And you still have the same feeling toward him now? Yes, because he had <coughs> the ultimate responsibility about safeguarding the south part of Vietnam. He had done a better job. If the first Republic of Vietnam was successful, we would not have ended up you know, in being in the mess that we had after 63, from 63 to 68. We have a lot of change in the different regimes. We may have averted, you know, the outcome that we saw. Uh, so uh, after uh, um, President Zim got assassinated, uh, what, what will happen now and where was uh, you about and how do you feel about the second I mean, regime uh, in South Vietnam? <coughs> well, so, so I, I, uh, well, at the time I, there's nothing much I could do. I was a medical student at the time. I was also uh, <coughs> in the military uh, medical school but uh, as I say I think that uh, what he did was not very uh, wise that's why you know we end up having the mess that we had and uh, by the time I graduated in 1966 so I had to join the army uh, for good you know, I always believe that you know, being a man, you have to live up to your maleness. And I always hate to hear uh, people say that if you are an intellectual, usually you only like to talk, to discuss, and you don't dare do anything. So to prove them wrong, I decided that once I become a doctor, mm -hmm. I will be joined the toughest. <laughs> Troops in the Vietnamese Army, obviously the airborne, not like the Marines here in the U.S. In the U.S., when you're talking about 
the toughest troops you talk about the U U.S. Marines, but for the Vietnamese, it's not the Marines; it was the Air War, because we still had the French tradition, and in the French Army, the the crack troops, the best troops, are the paratrooper. So I decided to join the paratrooper, <coughs> just to prove the point that even though you can be an intellectual, but you still have to have your conviction and you have to live your conviction. If you feel that the country is at war and you want to protect it, you have to join the army. So I did. And when I joined the army, I volunteered to serve in the paratroopers. Wow. It's kind of uh, slightly dangerous because <coughs> who is sound of mind and then you have to decide to jump, to go on an airplane and to jump out of a good working airplane to jump out, right? <laughs> you have to be... <laughs> Kind exciting. Of, uh, yeah, it was exciting, but uh, so, you know, you, you, you have to be a little more daring. It's just what I, I, I used to think when I was young. Yeah. Uh, tell me about uh, uh, your time during you was um, a doctor for the parachute <laughs> group a troop uh, in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Before we go to that, I would like to talk about why you choose to join the paratroopers at the airport. Please. please you know, as yeah. I say. I, 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 I was having a lot of French influence, mm -hmm. and there was a French uh, uh, Roman, um, uh, a French historian, and also a history teller, uh, Jean Lartigui. He wrote very nice books about the French paratroopers who were fighting in Algeria. Oh, okay. uh, <coughs> Les Centurions. Okay. So when I read that book, I felt so compelled to join the Airborne because I want to show that I also could do something good and positive for my country. So that I decided to be uh, be become an airborne. you know a bar trooper of yes. the Airborne. Yes. That's the reason why. I see. <laughs> and, and he just died recently. I just got an email from a man uh, from a friend of mine that he just died. Uh -huh. Yeah, in, you know, I in Paris, I think. Yeah. I see. Okay. And. Uh, I mean, as a physician for airborne, um, what were you doing? How what was you doing? Well, <coughs> well I, I was a physician, so therefore my main duty is not to fight, mm -hmm. but I have to go with the troops wherever they're going mm -hmm. and have to be with them. So sometimes we have to be at front line. Nice. So we have to jump with them when they go into military operations. So that's what I did. Yeah. And if you want to talk about you know, being the airborne, we have a very good story that I can tell you. Yes. I see here. Is this you just jumped out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. That is so, yeah. you here? Yes. So we usually we, we go in the airplane and we we'll jump out. That's mm -hmm. what we, I jump out anyway. I oh. already landed. Oh. And you I see, see these this people yeah, uh, jumping after me. So I see. it was. Uh, oh, yeah. so after you jump, you have to stand there for the next one, and you have yeah. to carry your. Yeah. Usually, like yeah, because when we jump, we 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 have a group of uh, of uh, that was during the uh, exercise. I see. So <coughs> you have what? to have this. I show you some pictures. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's what you have to wear when you are when you're jumping out. Oh, from the before airport, jumping, right? I see. So <coughs> you have your. They call it the dorsal. Uh -huh. You mean your the, the men shoot. You have to wear your back, and then you have an accessory, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, parachute in the front. That's called a ventral. Oh, okay. In case the bend doesn't open, mm -hmm. then you, you can always the, pull the cord and then open the up the, the second one. Okay. okay? Wow. <laughs> kind of, How old was you? Equipment. You look at very young and very handsome there. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I was 26 when I graduated from medical school, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Where was it here? Uh, what what uh, airport it was it? I think it was Tong Airport. Tong yeah, right, yeah. Oh, wow. Just, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Just to show you, you know, how sometimes how, you know, and, uh, stupid you are when you're young. <laughs> because you always believe that nothing could happen to you and nothing would ever happen to you. <laughs> and then uh, you, you jump with your group or troop here at a doctor? Yes, the, right. Where your medical supply, medical... I mean, well, you, whatever you carry with us, we have to carry in the back, see? Oh, oh, oh so in that this, Yeah, yeah, just bags. What do you carry anyway? It, with that little bag, what can you bring them? I mean, well, I, ha I have a small bag because I was a doctor, so I don't have to carry heavy things, but my comment, oh. they will have to carry a bigger bag, so they have to carry all the 
uh, you know, medical equipment, all the medicine, the, you know, the equipment that I have to use when we go in military operations. I see. And my job was to take care of the troops if they ever become wounded or if they become sick, they have to treat them. Because remember, when we go in the operation, the operation will last maybe two, three weeks, we'll be going in the jungle. You, can, you have no, no ways of communicating with the rest of the world. So if they are sick, I have to take care of them, carry them with us until we finish the operation and we could come back to our base. Do you have any uh, story that you still remember, like you jump in the jungle with the troop and somebody <coughs> sick or yeah. somebody you can save, you can somebody you... I can tell laugh. you my, 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 my real experience, you know, with the Air Wars. I remember when I uh, graduated from medical school, I had to get my refresher course so I have to get a refresher course so I can get to jump and get my insignia, my wings that I can, I'm really in airborne. Mm -hmm. You have to jump six times during the day mm -hmm. time and then one time at night, okay? Mm -hmm. After you complete your seven jumps, wow. then you can become a paratrooper. O officially? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. yeah. Officially, you can become a paratrooper. I see. So I did. <clears throat> so, and finally I got my orders to join my unit. My unit was already in full swing you know, military operations in the I Corps, the first corps, mm -hmm. it is, is just beside, you know, below the military zone. Mm -hmm. So I took the airplane and I flew all the way to Hue. Mm -hmm. So when I landed in Hue, I was very surprised. I saw a very, uh, you know, official, uh, I think, uh, troop of Vietnamese airborne in full gear, in military gear, at the airport. So I was very flattered. I thought it was for me that they had sent those troops to salute me <laughs> and to welcome me to the unit. So I, I, I stepped down from the airplane and, I, and, and, and I, I, I thought that they were coming to, to greet me, but it was not the case. They were there because they brought the coffin of one, okay, uh, officer that was killed the night before yeah. by a sniper I and I found out that it was the coffin of a captain and the captain was the uh, vice commander the second officer in command of my unit so they came there not to you know, welcome me but to give him the last orders to send his uh, coffin back to Saigon so I, well, that was humbling for me to recognize, you know, to realize that they, they didn't come to, to greet me, but they do just to yeah, accompany the, the vice commander back to Saigon because he was killed. So the war was yeah. so brutal. Yeah, the war was, was, was so brutal. Yeah. No place and then, for honor. And, yeah, I, I still have some fond memories. Uh, yeah. uh, like, you know, when I, I came to the units, so I was that fresh, minted, uh, you know, medical officer. So I thought I, I knew a lot of things, but I realized pretty soon that I didn't know much. I know about medicine, but I didn't know much about you know what to do when you are you know involved in the you know, combat situation. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day we had to go to try to clean up the demilitarized zone. So we went in with the U.S. Marine on their side, and we were with the Vietnamese uh, South Vietnamese Airborne on one side, and we had a meeting because every morning we have to have a meeting to decide, you know, to let me know what we should do and what we should, you know, supposed to be doing so I, I can prepare my, my comments to take enough equipment to take care of the, of the soldiers when we go military operation. We just have a meeting. So I walk out of the tent and I turn around, I hear a big noise and I see everybody hitting the ground. Okay, all the officers and all the troops, all my comrades were already in the crowd. I didn't know what was happening, so I was still standing there with my hands in my pocket and look around. <laughs> 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 and one of the officers got a, uh, a stop on his eyes. He started to bleed from his eyes. My second in command, my command, told me, Bashi, doctor, you know, I'm wounded, I, you know, I'm hit. So he was having blood coming from his belly. So I realized he was hit in his belly, and the other officer was hit in the eye. He, you know, he became blind. So 
He was telling me, why, why don't you lie down? Because they are shelling at us. <laughs> so I was going to, you know, show and hit the ground myself. But then I saw from the farther south away that the soldiers have already started to stand up. So I said, I don't want to hit the ground when the, everybody was up. <laughs> they would be laughing, you know, I would be the laughing stock of the battalion. So I decided I would not hit the ground, I was standing up there. Anyway. Uh, anyway, so I, I continued to stand up and I would lean down to take care of the patients, you know, I have to give them the bandage and take care of them and give them the medications. So I, uh, I took care of them. And the battalion commander was still very impressed with me. He was telling his uh, other officers, say, this young doctor, he's very brave. <laughs> he didn't know that I was so <laughs> stupid. I was so <laughs> didn't know what to do. <laughs> ignorant. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, can can you tell me that uh, some you know you have to treat some soldiers some that uh, very brutal um, that you still remember or still in your memory during that time. You know, some yeah. big battle. Yeah, that was, yeah, we, we, my unit took part in you know, some quite heavy and then, and, 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 and uh, I would say brutal uh, uh, operations. I remember during the Tet Offensive in 68. Oh, wow. Yeah. My unit was in way just before the Tet Offensive, but then we were ordered to commute back and to go back to deliver, you know, to clear. Saigon. So we were sent to deliver, to clear up the northern part of Saigon and uh, we were, uh, I think, uh, we, we suffered heavy casualties that, 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 that during that operation. And uh, to make the story short, when I was assigned to be the airborne, you know, surgeon for the 5th Airborne Battalion. I had 15 comment with me by the time I finished my two years of duty and I transferred the unit back to a new doctor. I have lost more than half of my comment, so seven of them. And eight of the seven, eight of the 15 have died. And I I, I, I myself, yeah, I think I, I was wounded very, you know, lightly once, yeah. yeah. Uh, you ever capture a, an enemy and you treat them? Yes. Sometimes, you know, when we are fighting, sometimes we would capture the uh, the prisoners. Okay. And I always make sure that we treat them uh, humanely. I remember one time I even had an altercation with the uh, battalion commander because there was a a Vietnamese uh, soldier, you know, the Vietcong was wounded, so they took him, and they would ask me to take care of him. So I took care of him. I, you know, I took care of his wound. I sutured him, and I put a bandage. And when they want to come, they want to question him. I refuse to release him. They say no, I would not release him. And we almost had a fight with the, <laughs> the officer <laughs> because they say no because I believe very strongly that once you put a wounded person under my care is under my care. I don't care. That's just you under my care. So when we go back, I will deliver back the prisoner to you, but I would refuse to relinquish that prisoner to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, you got an opportunity to talk to those, uh, I mean, prisoner, and what do you think about them? No, I, I usually, I'm just um, a medical officer, so I will take care of the wound and make sure that they will be treated, uh, you know, with uh, all the uh, proper care according to the Geneva Conventions. I always believe into that because I always believe in the rule of law. I see. Yeah. Um, do you have any feel for them? And I mean, what they dress, they look like. I mean. Oh, they. they you know, I always, you know, I remember, you know, when we took care of them, they are so pale, very malnourished, mm -hmm. but I respect them for their, for for, for their courage. And the, 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 yeah, the will to, to fight. You know, so I remember when we took some of them, we always have their, you know, we, we always find out what they have. And they gave with them a very small portion of rice. Okay, and the rice that they have, if I give it to my coban, they will refuse to eat it because it was so, uh, I think, you know, um, so long. And I think uh, it was, the rice has deteriorated. 
but they would still carry with them, you know, and they were not even able to eat them. They would use it only at the last instance. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, during the time that uh, you remember, you were uh, in the military during the time they called that, you know, they sent a lot of uh, American troops there. And then later, in 1973 or 68, they start, they called Vietnam, uh, Vietnam right, uh, yeah, right. Um, as a medical doctor, uh, or, or you already out of the military, tell, tell us about that, but do you, you compare uh, that the, the casualty during those two times, is the different, any different? <coughs> Well, I, I was with the uh, Air Force only for five years, from 60s, uh, I created 66, so I was with them until 1971, because I, after five years of taking care of them, uh, I get, you know, uh, I think uh, I had good like, fatigue, so I decided I want to do something different. But I didn't want to say that I will leave the Air Force. Uh, so I decided the only the best way is to do something better than being with the Air Force. So I say, well, I want to go to the U.S. to study. So uh, the Vietnamese uh, military has some scholarship. Mm -hmm. So all the merit. So I have to apply and take a test. So I took the test, and uh, with my good military record and the good results for the test, I was able to go to the U.S. That's so what I went to the U.S. for one year to study. Uh, public health at Tulane in Louisiana. I so, it's, so I went to Europe, you know, to to Tulane from seventy one, seventy two. So I finished my bachelor degree, and I came back in Saigon, uh, you know, in seventy two by July of seventy two. And you remember, at the time they had the operation in uh, uh, Hue, um. Hue, and then so so, so I I didn't participate in those those actions because I was in in, in the U.S. at the time. But so by the time I came back, you know, seventy two, I I didn't come back to the uh, airborne anymore because I had a new uh, degree. So they think they will put me to better use by sending me to the military school where I can now teach and impart more of my new skill to the military. Uh, uh, medical officer, so I was uh, assigned to the Vietnamese Military Academy, where I started to teach about public health. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Well, you got the opportunity to work with the American soldier or American medic during the war. What do you think about them? I didn't really work with the uh, with the uh, medics, but I did have contact with uh, the. Uh, medical officers and uh, usually when my soldiers, my old troops are being wounded sometimes in the battlefield, we have to evacuate them. And sometimes the helicopter will come to evacuate them, we don't bring them to the Vietnamese uh, unit to take care. You know, so because, you know, in the haste of the battle, they will take the troops wherever there is the facilities. So some of my Troops end up uh, being yeah, in the U.S. ships. Mm -hmm. Some of them would end up being in the U.S. military, uh, you know, uh, hospital. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to go with my uh, American uh, advisor okay. to pick them up. Then at that time, we'll be able to talk with them and have to have some, you know, communication with them. But usually, uh, as a military medical officer in the South Vietnamese Army, I do not have direct contact with the. U.S. Uh, military personnel itself, yeah. I see. So you didn't have a chance to talk to them to find out uh, what in their mind and they understand the war or they understand why they're there and they... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't have really contact with the U.S. troops at the large, mm -hmm. but in our, even in our military, you know, units, we always have advisors. You have U.S. advisors. Usually we have two. Uh, one officer and, and non-commissioned officer. So usually I would spend some time, you know, talking with them, chatting with them sometimes, yeah. yeah. But uh, if, if so, can you share about a little bit what you think about, you know, what in their mind when they were I think there? because we are in a very special position, because even if they were assigned to the Vietnamese uh, airborne troops, they were 
I think volunteer. They really had to believe the cause to, to, to join and to decide to join to and to fight alongside the you know Vietnamese uh, airborne. So those are I think pretty good dedicated soldiers. Yeah, and they believe and they understood why we have to fight and stand against the Cubans. Um Yes. Yes. Um Uh, so you socialize with them and talk with them, but more like in the professional level. Yes. Yes, I see. And we will say you don't uh, rely on them because I remember uh, sometimes when we run short of military equipment, then I will go to them and will explain to them why we need more, you know, equipment, and they will be willing to help uh, close to the. <coughs> Uh, airborne, you know, hospital. There was a field hospital called Third Field Hospital. I don't know. I don't remember if you know about that field hospital, which is located very close by in, in Tongshin. They have very good supplies. Sometimes when they need something that we do not have, mm -hmm. they will go and talk to my advisor, or, and they will ask them. They will show him why we did it. So usually he, they understood. So they will really help me to get those supplies. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well. Um, after that, you said that you uh, uh, go to uh, U.S. to study um, about medical, uh, public health. Can you tell me that uh, the first time you came to U.S., uh, what you, what were I mean, what did you see and what you were thinking? Well, it was very uh, good feeling when I first came to U.S. the first time in '71. You know, you, you have to understand that I was uh, serving in the military unit and I was seeing a lot of wounded soldiers. I had to take care of them. I remember sometimes, you know, when I was on duties, they would bring not uh, one or two soldiers being wounded back to the military hospital, but they would bring you know, truck loads of soldiers and I had to take care of. So I did a lot of, you know, water up surgery. So I was, I say, we, I, I, I got a little frustrated because I had to work so hard to take care of those wounded soldiers. So I want to have some a break. So that's what I, 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 I got a break by getting the scholarship to go to the U.S. Yes. So I went to the U.S. and it was uh, very striking to see how rich and how prosperous, okay, the U.S. was in 1971. But when I went on the campus, I was sometimes quite uh, disappointed and upset because at the time <coughs> there was the height of the anti-war movement in the college. And when we have uh, those meetings, sometimes they were very against the Vietnam War and there was a lot of, uh, I think, you know, peace activist students. I remember attending one of those rallies and they were shouting anti, uh, you know, American, anti-U.S. slogans, mm -hmm. and I was quite upset. <clears throat> In fact, when they knew that I was Vietnamese, that I, they thought I was a North Vietnamese, you know, student, I said, no, I'm not from North Vietnam, I was a South, I'm a South Vietnamese. So they asked me, well, why are you doing here? Why are you fighting the war? So I told them, don't talk to me like that. Because when you send your soldiers to fight in Vietnam, you send them for two duty, and usually your two duty lasted one year, and few of them would pay up to come back for second two of duties. But me, as a South Vietnamese, I had to be in the war already five years, okay? And I took a year of leave of absence to go to the U.S. to study, but when I come back, I would serve again in the Army, so my two duty would not end. In fact, when I Got back in '72, I had to serve for for you know uh, three more years before the end of the war before I could you know uh, get out from Vietnam. Yes. But at the time, I felt there was a very strong anti-war uh, movement, and I could understand why because here they are so prosperous and they are so peaceful. Okay, so they want to go and fight the dirty war and to die. So because of the death toll uh, that impact them so that they really don't want to continue the war effort anymore yeah but but why they seem like have better 
pleasant. I mean, feeling toward the North Vietnamese than the South Vietnamese, do you know? That's probably why, you know, because it's always easier to be, uh, okay, than to be, to be a U.S. foe than to be a U.S. ally. I see. Because they always think in terms of American, uh, you know, psyche. They want us to be like them, to be fully democratic, but therefore what we are fighting a war and we cannot fool democracy, even though, yes, we, we had a fair share of um, blame because we did not really fully have uh, a lot of uh, democracy. But you, you, you see what's happening in the U.S. right now. If you have full democracy, then people would not want to contribute to the war for. Why would they want to die? They wouldn't want to die. But in Vietnam, we do that. If we didn't win, we will lose. If we lose, we lose everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you are in a war, it's all or nothing things. It's not like a political debate where, well, you make some concessions. When you are in a war, it's an all or nothing situation. You either win or you lose. Right. Well, I see some picture here I want to ask you before we go to the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, stay of your life. Where was you in this picture? And well, that was this picture was taken in 1972. 1972. So I I came back to Vietnam, as they say. So I was reassigned to the Vietnamese Military Academy, which is a school for the military officers. So you are like a professor in medical school for military. Very right. Much, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just like you know that. So I I was assigned. I was teaching public health, okay. and I was in charge of you know the education program for the. Uh, medical officers. By medical officers, you have to include not only the doctors, okay, they call, but you also have a lot of administrative officers. They serve in the medical corps. I see. Yeah. Uh, look, look. And you have a lot of you know non-commissioned officers. You know yeah. they also have to go and get their training in medical matters. I see. Yeah. But uh, where was you at this time? Uh, uh, then there was a small party. You know, uh, I was wearing my. Uh, as they call the Ule folks, in my uh, small, uh, it's not big, uh, how do you say it, the Ule folk. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, I, I was, a, yeah, I, I was, okay. yeah, I was uh, uh, a major at the time. At the time. And that was my uh, second in command, uh, Captain T. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. And another picture here that uh, you and uh, your group, and can you explain what you were doing here? Oh, that that was, uh, you know, every year we have a group of Vietnamese doctors who graduate from medical school, so they have to join the army. Once they join the army, they have to undergo mm -hmm. basic military training at the you know, Vietnamese Military Academy. So once they graduated, we were to pin their uh, you know, uh, in China, uh -huh. okay, so we have to wear a full, you know, formal, uh, formal dress, yeah. yeah. That wow. was uh, one during one of those occasions. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, you involved with the uh, Vietnam War very much that uh, most of your life when you were in Vietnam. What do you think about Vietnam War in general? I think we, we, we lost the opportunity to to win and it was very hard. So I had my, you know, all uh, take on the Vietnam War. Uh, I, I, I talked with my American friends, so I told them the Vietnam War, you know, the loser side is South Vietnam, but not the U.S., because the U.S. did the lose the, in the Vietnam War. And they were very surprised when I make that kind of assessment because I always tell them the U.S. always thinks in terms of, okay, the U.S., uh, uh, you, know, you know, benefits. And when they went into Vietnam at the time, they were trying to contain global communism. And they were right because if they had not intervened at the time, 
Vietnam would have been lost, and at that time, communists would have spread not only to Cambodia and to Laos, but Thailand would be off. So the whole world, the whole Asian world, would be you know tainted in red. So they did the right thing by going to Vietnam and, and try to stop them. Okay, but once they were able to have a dialogue with China, then Vietnam become irrelevant. That's why they decide that they'll pull out from Vietnam. And to this day, I always maintain the fact that the U.S. didn't lose the Vietnam War. They achieved what they wanted. What they wanted is a dialogue with you know, China and to stop the spread of you know, global communism. And they achieved what they wanted at the expense of South Vietnam, unfortunately. So we are the sacrifier? Or? Yeah, I think we are the... <laughs> well, we, we have our share of blame For because God. they're right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because because I saw that when I came here in 71, 72, I saw that they were not interested in, okay, to continue the war. They want to spill the blood of American soldiers anymore. They wouldn't mind to spill, you know, to, to, to spend the, the, the material, but they want to spill the American blood. And I think our leaders, the Vietnamese leaders, fell at the time, at the time to understand that. They were thinking that, you know, with the commitment that they have made, they will stand steady in the commitment. But that is not the way the U.S. work. The U.S. government always think not only short term, but so long term. So they don't want to confront the Chinese. They don't want to confront the Russians, mm -hmm. but they want to contain them. So once they are able to achieve their goal, so there's no re more reason for them to continue to spill the, the American blood in Vietnam. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I heard that uh, American were reason, South Vietnam were reason for the war end the way it, it was, you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as I, as I say, Especially, you know, if you read about Mr. Kissinger, Kissinger is always planning to stop, okay, the global communism. For him, Vietnam is only a small part of his global strategy. Once he achieved his bigger strategy, which is called tenement of communism, then they would not mind to lose a smaller ally, even though I don't agree because I you know, I'm from South Vietnam. Yeah. So what do you think about, uh, how do you feel about it and what uh, experience or what uh, thought you want to share with the young generation, Vietnamese uh, young generation about on this issue? Well, you are asking a very difficult question for me to answer because even though I'm an American now, okay, since uh, 75 I came here, and so I have sworn allegiance to the U.S., so I'm now American. an American citizen. But I would never forget my Vietnamese ancestry and my Vietnamese heritage. But I'm not a Vietnamese anymore. Mm -hmm. So what I want to try to say to the young Vietnamese American, it could be different from what I would say to the Vietnamese living in Vietnam today. Well, you, we want a boat, uh, I mean, Vietnamese American and also young right. Vietnamese in Vietnam, I mean, on the war, uh, yeah. including Vietnam. Yeah. To all the Vietnamese Americans, I will tell them, you know, we have been given the opportunity to restart a new life here in, in the U.S. So I want them to be proud of their Vietnamese heritage and to show that when we came here after the war in 75 and later on in 79, we came here because we were yearning for freedom. And I want them to be proud of what we have done to get to try to keep our freedom in Vietnam. And uh, you can see some of the media now are starting to have different retrospective look at the Vietnam War. At the time, they were always thinking of us as the corrupt, okay, as very undemocratic, but they forgot that when we are fighting a war, you cannot have full democratic measures because in that case you cannot really fight the war. 
But now they are looking back, they have now a more, I would say, a more reasonable view of their former ally, which is the South Vietnamese government and the South Vietnamese army. They now start to see, well, the South Vietnamese army did contribute the fair share in the fight. The problem is, the U.S. policy in the past, or the media in the past, always take of Vietnam as the Vietnam War as the American War. Yeah. It should not be a it should not be a purely American war. It, you know, it is our war too. Because if we fail, and we did fail, that you saw what happened, and you are one of the direct consequence of the war because you can't live under the communist regime. So we show us with our feet when we flee the, the country to, to try to look for freedom. And I remember in the 1980s, you know, if you have allowed all the Vietnam has, would have fled Vietnam. And we see now, you know, people are yearning for freedom and democracy. Especially today, you know, you saw what's happening in Libya, mm -hmm. uh, you saw what happened in, in Egypt. Yes. So, if they had the freedom to choose, they would choose to opt for democracy, real democracy, yeah. Yes. Well, no, thank you for sharing that. I know that's sometimes difficult, but uh, we appreciate that. Uh, now, on uh, during like uh, about April 30th, 1975, where was you and what, what was she doing and how you get out of the country? Well, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I still remember, you know, even though it's been three, seven years, but I still remember that day, that night, <clears throat> because at the time I knew that <clears throat> the end was very near. And even though I did escape from the north to the south, and it was South Vietnamese myself. But I knew what would happen once the communists would take over. <clears throat> you don't have to have personal knowledge, but there's so much in the writing, in the books at the time. You can, I remember I read about what happened in Russia once the communists took over. But Russia was far long ago. But I also read the books about what was happening to China when you know, Mao Zedong took over. If you are an intellectual, okay, you have anything part of the old regime, you will suffer. Yeah. They'll make you suffer. And they will make you commit suicide because they will make you so shameful of the involvement with the old regime. That they have no choice but you have, if you want to live, that you have to escape. So I remember. That night, I took oh, you know, my wife and my kids to try to take them out of the country because I always believed that myself, I can get out of the country anytime I want. But they have my wife and kid that I would have been able to do it. So I took them to the airport to let them go, not myself. I didn't intend to go at that time. But you remember that night about 10 o'clock, my friend will come to tell me, they say, you know, they have said, if you want to go, you just have to put your name, and then where you go. But you can wear a military uniform. So I was sent to my civilian clothes, and I, I, I went. So I think I remember vividly when we start, I start to get the plane, they start to shell into the airport. And so after my plane took off, two more planes were able to take off, and that was it. They closed the airport, and there was no more. Uh, uh, U.S. military presence in Vietnam at that time, so I ended up in, in Guam. Yeah. How many ch children uh, did you have at that time? And um, yeah, I was married. Old? Yeah, right. And uh, I have two sons. Yeah, and uh, Mikey at that time was seven, and uh, Alan was only one year old. Oh, yeah. very young. Yeah, yeah very yes, young. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, what happened after that? Well, uh, what happened after that? I, I went to Guam. So one hour while I've been warm, they were not ready, they're not ready, and they're not prepared at all to have to receive. tens of thousands of uh, yeah. you know, people in, in, in their military barracks. Mm -hmm. So the next day I thought there was things that had need to be done. Mm -hmm. So even though the food was there, but there was no uh, 
provision to provide medical care. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to see the commander of the uh, naval base. I told him that you should think about having some kind of medical service provide for these people because when you have a lot of people who are suddenly gathered in a very small area, you're not careful, you have a problem in your hands. You have, you know, contagious disease, you have epidemics, you may have cholera, you may have all kinds of, you know, uh, contagious disease. So he looked at me and said, why are you telling me all those things? So I, I told him because I'm a medical doctor and not only that, I know about public health. When you have a lot of people, okay, assembled in the small area, you have to make sure that you prevent those things. So I told him there's a few doctors here in the group, so if you want, I can help you out, you know. So we can make uh, those people available to to back sick call. Yes. So I was able to help them. So we did a period of one day, we will have a, have a group of doctors. I would divide, you know, from the morning. A certain number of doctors will be taking care of the people. I forgot to ask you that um, you hurry to leave a country like that. Uh, besides your wife and your two children, uh, you you be able to bring anything with you? <laughs> what are you bring with me? Oh, yeah. I what I brought was in my bag. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I I brought some uh, dry milk. And you ask me why do I bring some dry milk? Because you know my son was only one year old. Mm -hmm. So I, I I didn't know that I would be able to go by I, by 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 airplane. Okay. So I would say we we may have to go flee by boat. So I always have to make sure they have enough food for him. That was the only thing that we were able to get out from here now. I couldn't even be able to bring even my diploma. It's still hanging in the wall in my office in, in Saigon. So how you can show people that you were a doctor? Well, it's a funny thing because what saved me was that in 71 I went to the U.S. I, oh, I, I went to study at Tulane. And at Tulane they have all my medical name. transcript or my name or my, you know, copy of my diploma. So when finally I reached you know, the U.S., mm -hmm. I was able to call them and was telling them that I'm here now in the U.S. Could you kindly send me a copy of my transcripts and all my, <laughs> you know, diploma? That's what they did. Okay. So I, because of that, I was able to get the copy of my di diploma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how many days you st were staying in? Uh, I mean, at Warm. And then what happened after the war? Well, so, yeah, I think maybe I will, I don't know, maybe I was one of the few, or maybe the only one who with those that they typically fit into uh, what you have, you know, in, you know, all the people you have interviewed so far. Yeah. Because you asked me, I'm, I'm a refugee, I would have to say no, I'm not a refugee, because I didn't have the status, because when I arrived in Guam, as I say, I was trying to help set up that medical, uh, you know, just, Delivery service for the uh, people in the warm, and then they start to interview all the people to ask you know what kind of uh, people they are. So when they asked me my, my status, I didn't know what I was, because at the time if you are a military dependent, then you go to the U.S. right away. Uh, you have no, you know, connections. Then they will put you as a refugee. So they asked me. What status are you? So I, I didn't know, but, but I was I, I was quick to say that in seventy one, in seventy two, I was in the U S. and I, you know, graduated from you know to learn, you know public school, but at that time I have applied to become a U S. immigrant at the time. I see. Uh, why did I apply? Because my sister was living in the U S. She told me to apply. I see. But I did this. I didn't say because I come back to Vietnam because my country was still at war, so I went back to Vietnam. But I did apply. So I say, did you apply? I say yes. So and they asked me. So what happened to your application? I, said, I didn't know. I just applied. <laughs> so they called back, okay, to the mainland, and they called the U uh, S. immigration. They still and they confirmed people, huh? that. That application uh -huh. was filed in seventy two and has been approved because I was wow. a doctor. As you remember, have to remember, yeah. in the seventies, doctors are very high demand. I see. Okay, there was a short supply of doctors at the time. If I you see. are doctors, they will give you priority. I see. So they, they told me, oh, so you are you are applied seventy two, you've been approved. So therefore, you are not a refugee. 
Oh. Okay, so you are an immigrant, so they stamped me uh -huh. and they took me away from the group of the people who were oh. there. They put me in different part of the camp. What does it mean to you and your wife? And I, I, your I, I didn't know what was going to happen because mm -hmm. I was still in charge of mm -hmm. dividing the workload for the doctors. Mm -hmm. And within hours, they put me to a different part of the camp, and I have no way of going back to where I was. Yeah. Some of my friends were very upset with me afterwards when they found out that I completely disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> but because they put me in different part, and they wouldn't allow me to go back yeah. to the other part. And within a few hours, they put me in the airplane, mm -hmm. a 707 uh, you know, Boeing, and they flew me to San Francisco. Why San Francisco? Because they say that I'm a, I'm not a refugee, therefore I, can, I do not belong to that group anymore. So I'm an immigrant. So I have to go back to the U.S. Uh -huh. So when, when I landed in, in, in the uh, Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco, I didn't know what to do. So I asked one of the stewardess, say, what should I do? She looked at me and said, what do you mean, what do you do? You are free. <laughs> 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 but so, you're free, you more no money. Did you bring any money? I have $1,000. Oh, $1, That's not the only thing that I have. I see. So, what? so I took a bus, to, I went down to Chinatown in San Francisco. I did. The same trip that I did in '71 when I first came. So oh. I went back to the same hotel. I took a room, uh, and then I think it was late at night. So, but the next morning when I woke up, I came down. I, I bought the newspapers, and I found out that you know, South Vietnam has fallen. Uh, President, you know, Yuvamin has you know surrendered, and there was no more South Vietnam, and they didn't know what to do. So. How do you feel at that time when you look on the paper, you saw all that, you know? Oh, that, that, I, I felt kind of lost and uh, it was, you know, it's difficult to describe how I felt at the time because I suddenly feel that on my Air Force, you know, I was with the, you know, Army, I fought the war and suddenly now, I, I lost everything. Suddenly now, it dawned on me, upon me that I now have become a, a man without a country. It was very, very hard feeling for me, and for almost three years, when even after when I went to into residency training program, they always asked me, you know, where did you come from? I said I come from Asia, but I would refuse to say I came from Vietnam because it was very hard for me to admit the fact that I was part of a you know, lost cause. I see. Yeah. Well, you in San Francisco with a wife, two young children, and a thousand dollars in your pocket. How you start your life? But how I start my life. So the first thing I I go to school uh, in Tulane, mm -hmm. and I ask them. You know, that's why I ask them about my transcript. They they they, they look about the records. Yeah, hey, I, I know you were here. So I always ask them. You remember when I was there? You offered me a job, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to take it because I had to go back to Vietnam to you know fight the war and to be you know because we still had the war. So do you still have some job for me? So say no, that job we offer you was in South America, but you refused to take it. But no problem, you know, you have all your credentials, so you can always join us to start, you know, as a resident. Yeah, you will, we were more than glad to, to, to take you on right away. So I was very happy. So I thought that that resolved all my problems. But they said, but you know, we are in May, we are in May of 1975. Oh. And when you Sign the contract will be for July of '76, oh. so I have to wait 14 months. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I told them that I got to wait 14 months because I have <laughs> a family to feed. <laughs> yeah. I say I'm sorry, but you we will have your name if you want to join us in July '76. You know we we're more than welcome, but I couldn't wait. You know with only one thousand dollars in my hands for 14 months, so that I have to call my sister who is living in Connecticut at the time. Mm -hmm. So she told me, well, we have always some, you know, hospital around here. You can come back here, fly over here, and then we'll go find out what you can do. So I bought one-way ticket for, for us to fly to Hartford, and I came to Hartford to be with my sisters. So I started to go around and look for a job in one of the three hospitals that I went in Hartford. I went to the first hospital in Hartford. They told me the same story like to let. Oh, we were more than glad to take you, but you had to wait until July of '76. They said, No, I can't wait. <laughs> so I went to the second hospital, which is the Mount Sinai Hospital. 
and uh, they say, well, the same story, but I put the kids in the bill, but I need to work because I have a wife and kids to support. So they, so the chief of the training program was telling me, well, I know uh, uh, the chief of the emergency room. I think he, he he was, you know, he has served in Vietnam. You can go talk to him. So I went down and talked to him, and he asked me what unit I was serving with. As I thought, I was with the Vietnamese Airborne. So he asked me, so we chat, and I told him about, you know, all the my war experience. He was very, I think, uh, uh, impressed and he said, oh, okay, you want to work? You can come work with me. So when can you start? I said, any time. He asked me, can you start tomorrow? I said, fine. So less than 10 days after I left Vietnam, I was working in the Mushu Suru in uh, Hartford. Wonderful. Less than 10 days, yeah, yeah. afterwards, yeah. How much did you get paid? <laughs> that was pretty good. I still remember he offered me 45000 Oh, at a that year, time? At yeah. that time. That was very good, yeah. So you you were one of very lucky that you found you can you you were not obviously doctor physician but you be able to work in your field and earn a lot of money right. to begin with. Yeah. yeah. So as far as uh, my profession was concerned, I think I was very you know lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found out pretty soon that I could not really practice full time because I didn't have my license. So in order for you to have your license, you have to take an exam. But Connecticut at the time required that I have at least one year of training. I see. So after working two two, two months, uh, it just happened they have a vacancy in the training program. One of the doctors was supposed to become a resident at that hospital couldn't make it because he was com supposed to come from England and he has a problem with his visa so he couldn't make it. So the chief of training told me, well, Dr. Wang, instead of waiting for one more year, for next year to get to your training program, mm -hmm. you can start right away if you wish to. So they offered me the job right then. So the funny thing is, after two months of working and and, and earning forty five thousand a year, I become a, an intern. Wow. As an intern, I remember the pay was only sixteen thousand. So oh. I dropped from forty five thousand to now to sixteen thousand. <laughs> how how but, did you adjust? But but you know, the chief of the ER was very kind. He told me, Doctor Wang, I know that you you are do a good job. So. If you want, you can come work with me anytime you want. Okay, so if I have some free time, I just come down and sign my name, and I can get five hundred bucks, you know, for eight hours work. Good. So I supplement my income right away. Oh, wonderful! So um, since I came to the U.S. every year, every single year, I'm still shocking with my wife now. Say I never not pay tax since I came to the U.S. Yeah. Every year I have to pay tax. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're happy to do so. Well, yeah, we have got to be to society, yes, I do believe so, yeah. Yes. Well, um, of course you come back to uh, your profession, you have a job right away, not the way you want it yet, but uh, I mean, it, it go in that, um, you know, way. Do you have any uh, culture shock when you have to live in this uh, new society at all? Oh, yes, because uh, we... Uh, I tell you some some shocks that I have. I, I, I as I say, I start to work, and uh, there's some things that I could not really fully understand at the time. Uh, I remember one day I had uh, patients coming to the emergency room, and she was having problems. So I was telling them that yeah, you have problems, but you also have problems because you are very obese. You should try to lose weight. And she took it the wrong way. She, she told me, you don't understand anything. I'm obese because I am poor. And my first reaction was, how could you be obese when you're poor? Usually in my country, when you're poor, you are very skinny because you don't have food to eat. <laughs> my first reaction would be to tell her that, but I refrained from telling anything as she tried to talk to me. Why? Because you know, when I'm poor, I cannot have enough money to buy all the nice foods so I can stay slim. So I, because I'm poor, I have to eat you know, poor quality junk food. That's why I'm getting obese. And I have to refrain myself from telling her, no, that's not the case. Because I, I know very well in my country, whether you're poor, you have no food to eat. Therefore, you cannot be, skinny, uh, yeah. you have to be skinny. You cannot be you know, obese. Yeah. But some certain things like that, yeah. I yeah. see. Do you have any problem during your, <laughs> I mean, practice uh, your profession here because of the, 
I mean, uh, different culture, people like like that time or anything like that. Up until today, that um, you still have to deal with. Or you very much. Uh, I think that because I was living up in Connecticut, you know, you remember I came here in '75. So I, uh, after working in the room for two months, I joined the uh, training program right away. And after a year, uh, the shift of the year called me, well, you want to come back working for me now? You can, but I don't know you. I don't think you will accept to come back to work for me. And he was right because uh, when I came here, after a year of training, I realized that I have a lot of I know holes in my education, so I want to finish it. So I, I stay. I finish my three years of training in internal medicine, and then took the three years of training in hematology, because I do not only want to do, uh, you know, to get a job, but I want to have a good education. So I, did, I did all my trainings, and I was able to. Uh, well, I always feel that you know. Life has to be worth of living. So when you are living, you have to do it right. So if you are doctors, you have to be a good doctor. So I decided I will finish all my trainings. So I finish all my trainings before I would start my practice. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I think talking about my profession, I am. I'm very lucky, I think so, because I talked to my actual wife, she always saying, me, you, you, you seem to be uh, born with a civil spoon. I say, no, I was born with a civil spoon, but I always believe that when you live, you have to try to do the right thing under any circumstances. I think that's because of my Catholic bringing, because whatever you do, you have to do, make the right choice. Once you make the right choice, then whatever happens, you know, things will exactly. eventually turn out the right way. Yeah. What about your wife and your children? Do they have any culture shock on how they started life? Yeah, yeah, there were some culture shocks, but uh, I know I keep. That's why I keep telling you know, my son too. You, you have to do your best. Whatever, yeah. You know, I keep telling them. You know, I was not supposed to be a doctor. I, you know, when I started out, I want to be having a good life, I want to be working in the foreign ministry, you know, having parties, you know, having nice life. But I was not able to do so, so I, I, I joined the army. And I, I fought and I not work and I served. But we're losing the war. So that is my doing. But regardless, you have to keep your try to keep your head up and to keep your shit up and try to do best in the early circumstances, and eventually things will become all right. So I keep telling my son that whatever you do, whatever field you choose to be, try to be the best. That's the only thing I can tell him. Do you think that important to keep the uh, Vietnamese uh, heritage in your family? If so, how you enforce that in your family? Well, <clears throat> That is uh, something that I had not thought of when I, you know, in 75 when I came here. In 75 when I came here, I say, well, I want to rebuild my life. And I want, you know, my family, my kids to have a good life as an American. Because at the time, I never thought I would be able to go back to Vietnam. And for me, Vietnam would be part of the past. Because I remember at the time when we came here in 75, not only did we lose the war in Vietnam, but even America at the time was free trenching. Okay, they have a lot of problems that they never could recuperate for, for a long period of time. And Kobe seems to be winning everywhere. So I thought that it was the, the Vietnamese part. I was always remain a Vietnamese, but I had no hope that I would ever be able to go back to Vietnam because they would have the bamboo curtain, and that's no way you get back. In fact, from 75 until 1994, we had absolutely no communication with Vietnam. Yes. But things have to change in 79. Yeah. By the time I finished my training, when I started my practice, and what do we see? We see the both people arriving. Yeah. And uh, I never forgot about my Vietnamese heritage, and I started to do something to help the Vietnamese people who came in 79. When I finished my training and I started my practice, the Vietnamese both refugees started to come. And they came to the U.S., they came to Connecticut. And the university at the time, Connecticut is a very small state, 
they have those influx of refugees. They come from uh, different cultures. Mm -hmm. And they are not like the first wave of immigrants in, seven, in 1975, mm -hmm. because the first wave of immigrants were relatively better Best educated. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have contact with the government, mm -hmm. or they are relatives mm -hmm. of the U.S. servicemen. So at least they, they have some kind of Western you know, relationship, Culture. right? Mm -hmm. uh, cultures, knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's of the nine, so those are poor people. Certain people are very highly educated, but a lot of people are fishermen. They have absolutely no idea of what life in the U.S. would be. For, for them, there was a real cultural shock. Yeah. They were transported from a 19th century kind of country into the 21st century <laughs> country. And the doctors who were taking care of them really didn't know what to do. So I had to tell the uh, university to open a, a clinic, they call it specialty clinics, geared toward delivering care to the refugees. Because remember, it's not only from Vietnam, but you have some refugees coming from from, from Cambodia and from, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did have, uh, I did help the university uh, create that kind of clinic. They call the Indochinese Refugee Clinic, yes. where I would take care of them and help, you know, them. And uh, that's also another uh, interesting things if you want to hear, because being a doctor here in the U.S., they are so well organized. And they know very well about the usual common problems you have in the U.S., but they have not actually not, okay, used to the kind of illness that you find in Vietnam. Like here, if your patient hit the emergency room and you have a fever, the doctor will think right away, oh, he has a fever, so they think about endocarditis, infections of the heart valve, because it's the most common disease, you know, when you have undisciplined fever. But from person who are coming from Vietnam, straight out from Vietnam or from Cambodia. If you ask the Vietnamese doctors, what is the main cause of fever? They would never think about endocarditis. Okay, in Vietnam, when you have fever, the first thing is, it may, you, you, know, you may have malaria or you may have typhoid fever. That's the most common things. But you never find any malaria or any typhoid fever in the U.S. Yes. In fact, I remember I, w I was uh, attending, and then they called me, there's a Vietnamese patient, and he was having shields and fevers, that they didn't know what to do. So I said, yeah, do a blood smear. Mm -hmm. They said, why do you blood smear? Because that's why you find the parasites in the blood, because when you do a blood smear, mm -hmm. you can look under the microscope and find right away the cause of the disease. Yes. So they were surprised, because they, the, the, it's not that the doctors don't know, but they have to think about it mm -hmm. because they have to think about tropical disease. Mm -hmm. But tropical disease in Connecticut, forget about it. Maybe in Houston, but in Connecticut, they say. Nobody no, have a clue. <laughs> exactly, nobody has a clue, yeah. Uh, doctor, that the reason I see here that you have so many, uh, you wrote so many, um, I mean, uh, material here uh, regarding to that, uh, you know, um, Gisu, um, how many material or book did you write? I didn't write books, but I wrote uh, many articles about yeah. what kind of uh, problems mm -hmm. the Indochinese refugees would, you know, be expected to have. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the books and I, I wrote those articles, and they were published in the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Journal of American Medical Association, which is a very well-read book, you know. Uh, up, uh, I read the Annual Review of Medicine and Journal of Public Health. And I also went uh, around the states in the northeast part of the region to, to talk about the problems that the Indochinese refugees would have to help the American doctors. Okay, you know, talking to you, you understand about quadrobic cow yaw. Okay, mm -hmm. everybody knows what it is. You know, what you have, you don't feel good, you do those quadrobics that will relieve your symptoms. But it was a catastrophe. Okay, for the first Vietnamese who came to Connecticut. In fact, I remember one officer was arrested because, you know, when he brought his child to the emergency room and they saw all those marks on his on the skin, they thought he was abusing the kids. Mm -hmm. And they had to come down and tell him, no, 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 he was taking care of his son because that's the proper way to treat, you know, a person who has, you know, fever. So I have to try to explain the cultural difference between Vietnamese and Americans. That's what I have to 
not only write those articles, but I have to go around different uh, university and uh, to, to talk about. I heard some very sad story. I heard some even worse than that because some area that they don't have doctor with knowledge like you do yeah. to explain to, you know, I mean the system. So somebody even have to go in jail for that. Do you yes. hear about that? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. in the beginning, that, that's why they want to avoid those problems. So once they were aware of it, they would invite me to go and around and, you know, on the speaking tour to talk to the public health people, you know, yeah. yeah. Have you, you remember any particular story about, uh, in that regard? I mean, yes, as I said, that was a. I remember there was a. Uh, it makes the newspapers too because uh, that uh, father, he he used to be a officer in the Soviet military navy, and uh, his son was sick, so they his wife gave him the the quadruple, and there was those marks in the back. So the American doctor, when they see marks in the backs of the kids, he would think right away that he was abused. Mm -hmm. So he, they, they brought, they, 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 they put that father in prison. Oh. So I have to go and explain to them why. So I they see. finally released him. They released yeah. him. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, have you go back to Vietnam? Yes, I. It's in fact for almost 19 years I was always eager to go back to Vietnam to find, to see with my own eyes what has happened to my country. In fact, I, the first few years, I don't know if you have asked the other people you have interviewed, do they have the kind of nightmare that I, I had for many, many years? When I would be sleeping and I, I have the same nightmare, a recurrent nightmare, that I knew that I have escaped Vietnam, but for some reason, I came back, and when I sneaked back in the country, they called me and they put me in jail. And I was very upset because I said, why was I so foolish to go back after having escaped from Vietnam? And I asked of some of my friends who came later on, after I, I, I was able to renew contact with them, they, they told me they have similar nightmare too. Because when you have unfinished business, a psyche always try to go back to find out What's happening? Yes. So it finally in 1994, when finally the U.S. lifted the embargo and they would allow an American citizen to visit, visit that I, I I went back the what first, first time. Yeah. What do you feel when you come back the first time? You see any change and like you said that would you be able to reconcile with yourself that nobody chasing you, put you in prison anymore? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, when I first landed in, 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 in Vietnam, I was a little jittery because I was, I was nervous because uh, when the uh, airplane landed and I stepped out of the airplane uh, and, and I went to the official, he was wearing that, you know, green uniform and I remember vividly the last time I saw those green uniforms, he was, uh, we were sh shooting at each other yes. <laughs> and he was sitting there uh, looking at my, by my paper. And uh, I was kind of nervous, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. And uh, the first thing that struck me when I walk into Saigon, I see those that big billboard, enjoy Coca Cola. And okay. you know, my, my thought at that time, oh my gosh, we fought the war, and how many people died, and how much devastation there was to come yeah. back. And I see that big billboard, enjoy Coca Cola. What has happened? What happened to all the sacrifice that we have, you know? Was uh, for yeah. Well, uh, what do you think? I have the two last question. The first one: uh, What do you think about the Vietnamese American community here in U.S. will become in the next ten, twenty years? <clears throat> when I came to the U.S., I started to live in Connecticut for for. 25 years I was living up in Connecticut and there was a very small Vietnamese community. It's not like a thriving and prosperous community like you see here in uh, Houston or in California. And I have to admit I, I became even prouder of my uh, Vietnamese heritage and ancestry since I was able to come down here to Houston and to again participate in the vibrant uh, Vietnamese community. Uh, 
even though we lost the war and we have to flee our country. But I think we brought with us a lot of high spirited and uh, highly motivated people. And I think you, you can see we contribute, we have started to contribute, you know, a lot to this uh, new uh, country of ours. And in my field, I, I work, and not only being a doctor, but I also work uh, with the social security, I work with the judge, and I keep talking to them, and they are always impressed, and um, they are always thinking highly of us as the newest group of immigrants which has uh, really closed the gap. Of course, there's some segments that have, uh, have struggled, but I think as a group, we have to understand that the Vietnamese uh, have contributed a lot to this uh, new society. Yeah. What is your outlook for the Vietnam country? My hope and my belief is they cannot resist the winds of history. Once the history will start to turn, is a no way back. But it will take time. And uh, I think, I hope that within the party, the Communist Party, they will recognize that I will change. Okay, what do you want to share? And I didn't ask you yet. Go on. Well, I always try to be true to myself. You, know, you always try to be a decent human being. So wherever you live, wherever you end up living, I never thought when I was growing up in Vietnam that one day I'll be living in the U.S. and become a U.S. citizen and we'll spend the rest of my life here and be buried here in, in American soil. But it doesn't matter. So whatever you do and wherever you live, you always try to be a decent person and to try to do the best you can under any circumstances. And I always, to this day, believe that you know, when you are living, your, your life has to be worth living. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hoàng Ngọc Zhao, um, on behalf of the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation, I truly appreciate you take time, come here, open your life, and share with uh, us and with the young generation. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, you know, being part of your uh, great, uh, I think, uh, work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.